We're going to spend time talking about the elderly patient, all right? And uh, we're at, these are the formal objectives that you see up here. We're just going to get rid of them, all right? Um, I love geriatric emergency medicine, and uh, there's a handful of lectures that I do on geriatric EM. I can probably summarize all of my lectures with one slide that I'm going to show you right up here. Here it is. It says, he couldn't find a thing wrong with me, the quack, all right? For all intents and purposes, when you're working in the emergency department and you have an elder patient in your emergency department, every one of them is about to die. You have to have a healthy degree of paranoia, no matter what their initial chief complaint is. They come in with a little bit of a headache, it's either a temporal arteritis or a subarachnoid hemorrhage. A little bit of back pain, it's a ruptured AAA. If they're a little queasy, it's a STEMI. If they've got flu symptoms, it's anthrax. All right? And if they have stable vitals, they're actually in occult shock. You've got to be really, really paranoid about these patients. And with regards to infections, I'm going to talk a little bit about why that paranoia is so important and why a lot of what we were taught about general infectious disease may not be relevant to the elder patient in the emergency department based on the literature that's been coming out over the past 10 years or so. This is a little outline of what we'll talk about. In the interest of time, we're going to skip over skin and soft tissue stuff and delirium. There's a little bit in the handout about that. So we'll start out with just a little demographics about the elder population in general. Currently about uh, 10 to 15, maybe as much as 20% of the U.S. population is over the age of 65. And these statistics also apply to every first world country, whether we're talking Europe, we're talking Canada, we're talking about Asia, wherever you're, Australia, New Zealand, wherever you're talking about first world countries, these statistics seem to be very consistent across the board. 10 to 15, maybe as many as 20% of every population is over the age of 65. And there's nothing magical about 65, but that's just what most of the statistics use. We've all seen 40-year-olds that have the physiology of a 70-year-old. We've also seen 70, 80-year-olds that are out running marathons, right? So you need to take this data and use it for your patient. Don't necessarily get hung up on the age of 65, but that's what the statistics show. By the year 2030, 20% of these first world country populations are going to be over the age of 65. And a lot of the geriatricians like to divide the elderly into three groups, the young old, middle old, and old old. Young old, 65 to 75, middle old, 75 to 85, and the old old, over 85. The old old group, over the age of 85, is the fastest growing subsegment of the U.S. population. So we're going to be seeing more of the elderly and the oldest of the old than ever before in the coming years, and many of you can probably attest to that. There's a lot of regional variation in these numbers as well. I've got a friend from residency who works down in Tampa Bay, Florida, where the average age of his patient population is 80 years old. When people register, they get a hospital bracelet and levofloxacin. Um, you know, 40% of all EMS arrivals, 50% of all ICU admissions are older patients. Length of stay is a lot longer. They undergo much more extensive radiologic and lab workups. And yet, despite these more extensive workups, they have a much higher bounce back rate, about four times higher bounce back rate. When, in other words, when they get discharged, four times more often than young patients, they'll bounce back, come back for a second or third visit for the same problem. And they have a much higher misdiagnosis rate. And because of their poor physiology, when they're misdiagnosed, they have a much higher mortality and certainly morbidity rate. So it's very important to keep this in mind. In terms of infectious diseases, fever accounts for about 10% of all um, presentations in the elderly. They account for about 65% of all cases of sepsis, and they have a much higher mortality, especially if they're bacteremic. Think about this. About a third of elder patients that are bacteremic are going to die during that hospitalization. So there's a tremendous mortality, and the onus is on on us in the emergency department to make that diagnosis very quickly. Now I'm going to try to highlight some of the key points by just changing the font color. So whenever you see some orangish or reddish font color, please take special note of that. Those are very important points. This is one of the important points I want you to keep in mind. You know, GU, lower respiratory tract, and so on, no big surprise. But what was a surprise when I reviewed this literature is that up to 20% of all elderly patients that have bacteremia, the source is in the belly. And that's not typically a place that I'm thinking about. I'm looking at the lungs and the urine and so on. Please remember this. Don't forget about the abdomen when a clear-cut source is not present on your basic workup. Check the belly. Think about even getting an ultrasound or a CT if necessary, if you're looking for that source and can't find it. So that's key point number one. 
All right, I'll throw some questions out here. Why are we taught to be so conservative in terms of disposition? You know, a young person comes in with a unilobar pneumonia, they're going to get antibiotics and go home. An elderly patient with a unilobar pneumonia almost always is going to be admitted to the hospital. Why do we have to be so conservative with them? Very simple. Key point number two, all elderly patients should be considered immunocompromised. Just the way a patient would be if they're on steroids or chemotherapy, think about the elderly patient as a group of people who are immunocompromised. They have a decrease in cell-mediated immunity, decrease in antibody titers and antibody response, and they also have many other comorbidities, for example, diabetes or cancer, that puts them at even higher risk of, of uh, immunocompromise. Malnutrition contributes poor circulation. They have breakdown of natural barriers, for example, skin. They have little cracks in the skin, which is a portal of entry for many different types of bacteria. And also, in their living environments, they're oftentimes exposed to many more infections, especially if they're in a nursing home, right? I mean, you can just probably suck MRSA right out of the air in many of these nursing homes, right? How do you define fever? In most patients, we think of fever as 100.4 Fahrenheit, 38 degrees Celsius. Well, if you use that traditional definition that we've all been taught, only about a third, maybe, maybe a little bit more than a third of patients that have an acute infection don't have a fever using that definition. There's a few reasons for that. They have a decreased thermoregulatory capacity, abnormal production, and response to endogenous pyrogens. They have a delayed febrile response. Young people develop fevers in the first day of bad infections. Elder patients may take several days, and then making things even more complicated, elderly are about three times more likely, three to four times more likely, to develop hypothermia in response to serious, deadly infections. And as a result, you can't rely on fever as your marker of infection. Don't ever assume that the patient doesn't have an infection just because they're not running a fever. Again, using this definition of 38 degrees Celsius, right? Another interesting point is, you know, when we talk about kids, most of the time, I don't know, 80, 90% of the time, maybe more, when kids come in with a fever, it turns out to be viral, right? It's a virus. Mom, it's a virus. In the elderly population, those stats are turned upside down. Less than 5% of elderly patients with the fever turn out to have a virus. The majority of them, by far, have some type of bacterial cause of their fever. So again, you need to be very, very worried about these patients. Even if they have cold symptoms, oftentimes they'll harbor a UTI or a pneumonia as well. Another very important point that's been found in the literature is that elderly tend to have a lower baseline body temperature. We've all, we all think about 98.6 as the normal human body temperature, but in the older patients, the baseline body temperature decreases. And as a result, we need to change our thought process about what defines a fever. This is key point number three. A lot of the geriatricians and infectious disease folks recommend thinking of 99 degrees Fahrenheit or 37.2 Celsius as your cutoff for what defines a fever in the elderly. And if you're using rectal temperature, again, that's going to be lower than other uh, younger patients as well. So redefine what you consider fever in the elderly population. If you happen to have a baseline body temperature, then that's very good if they increase 1.3 degrees Celsius or about 2.5 degrees Fahrenheit from the baseline. Usually we don't have a baseline of what they're normally running. So I like to think about 99 Fahrenheit or 37.2 Celsius, and if they're above that, then that patient has a fever. So in other words, 37.8 is a fever in an older patient. And by redefining fever in those numbers, what the studies have shown is that you increase your sensitivity for picking up bacterial infections from 40 to 83%, while still maintaining a pretty darn good specificity. So you're not going to suddenly start calling everybody fever. The specificity is still pretty darn good, but you're going to pick up a lot more because the sensitivity increases. So key point number three, redefine what you consider a fever. All right, next question. How reliable is the initial evaluation in detecting the presence of a fever? All, all the things that we were thought to think of, you know, cough and white count and all those other things, how good are those in the elderly patients? Well, what we know based on the literature is that classic symptoms and signs are not always very helpful. All of the following have been found to fail at predicting the presence of bacteremia. Fever, we talked about that. Respiratory symptoms like cough, 
is not always reliable. We'll talk more about pneumonia in a bit. Urinary symptoms, dysuria, frequency, not always present in elder patients with UTIs. Abnormal vital signs, with the exception of tachypnea, we'll talk about that. White count can be normal in up to 45% of elderly patients that have bacteremia, right? And I always tell our residents, the white count is the last refuge of the intellectually destitute. Never rely on a white count to rule in or rule out the presence of a dangerous infection. All right, 45% normal white count. In fact, some of the most dangerous infections can be associated with the relatively low white count. Hemoglobin, B1, creatinine, oftentimes unreliable as well. Now, key point number four, delirium and tachypnea. I want to hammer those two words into your heads. Over and over and over, delirium and tachypnea tend to be very common in elderly patients with infections and oftentimes overlooked. Tachypnea as well, especially, is probably the most unappreciated vital sign, right? Everybody in our emergency department pretty much has a, a respiratory rate of what? 20, right? If I ever, I would just one day, I, I want to see a prime number. Give me 13, Give me 17, right? But never, it's always 18 or 20. Somehow, everybody has an even number. When you see a respiratory rate of 20, it means nobody checked. Probably true for 18 also, all right? Stand at the bedside, take a few seconds, and count the respiratory rate, and you will be surprised how often tachypnea is the first marker of a dangerous infection in the lungs, in the belly, in the urine, First marker of sepsis is the first lab, it's the first vital sign abnormality that goes bad. Pay attention to respiratory rate. And when you see 20 on that triage note, just count it yourself because it means that at triage they didn't really pay attention to it. It's a very, very sensitive, it's not always real specific for a specific location, but it's a very sensitive early marker of a dangerous infection from head to toe somewhere. There's oftentimes an infection and delirium as well. Elderly patients that have delirium Think medications, if there are new medications, and there's many things. But of course, the first thing, you're going to think medication and infection, please. All right? Common pitfalls. We tend to be very, very bad at being aggressive with resuscitation. And I think part of it is because we worry so much about inducing CHF. We'll talk more about sepsis in a second, but just as a, as a simple example, Studies have shown that when a patient is septic, even elderly patients that are septic, they're usually six to eight liters depleted. And as a result, they need a lot of IV fluids. Haney talked about the importance of IV fluids yesterday. They need IV fluids. And yet, with the elderly patients, people are very afraid to induce, uh, give aggressive IV hydration because they're afraid of causing CHF. You know what? Your septic patient, even the 70-year-old, is probably about six liters down. Be aggressive with resuscitating them. Otherwise, they're just going to have persistent ischemia to vital organs because they're under or uh, resuscitated. Early markers of sepsis or ischemia to vital organs, oftentimes base deficit and lactate levels. Lactate is a very good marker, and I think people universally are using lactates much more often. Remember, if you get one lactate, plan on repeating the lactate as well because your repeat lactate is going to tell you how good of a job you're doing at resuscitating the patient. So Corey Slovis always says one EKG begets a second EKG. I would say the same thing for lactate. If you get one lactate, you should be planning on getting a second lactate in just a couple of hours after that. All right, take a little mental break here. It's late morning. I mentioned yesterday, some of you know, I, I like collecting signs, and people from this conference have actually sent me a lot of really interesting signs. This takes us a second. I love this. this. Somebody from last year sent this to me. This says, uh, texting while driving kills, but for more information, text safety <laughs> to 71. It's probably a couple car accidents there. And I love this one. I don't know where this is from. Um, the caption under this is that uh, it's a great place for father and son bonding, apparently. <laughs> so, Okay. Let's keep moving on. Let's talk about some specific infections. We're going to talk about UTIs, we'll talk about pneumonia, we'll talk about sepsis, and then we'll, we'll be done. So first of all, is UTI any different in the elderly? Well, of course, otherwise we wouldn't be here talking about it, right? So elderly are at increased risk of developing urinary infections. Why is that? Well, elderly patients oftentimes have urinary stasis, an increase in post-void residual volume. What does that mean? When a normal young patient voids, you go to the bathroom, you urinate, Usually there's less than 50 cc's of urine remaining in your bladder after you've tried to get rid of it all, 
With elderly patients, there can oftentimes be 100, 150, 200, and that urine that becomes stagnant in there can oftentimes be a good medium for developing bacterial infections. They don't void quite as much. They have poor detrusor function. They have outlet obstructions. For example, BPH is a big-time risk factor for UTIs. A few, uh, few other things, they can have retained renal or bladder calculi, which become sources of infection as well. What do we do here? We're not forwarding. <laughs> okay, go ahead, forward. I'll just raise my hand. How's that? Oh, actually, you know what? Can I use this? There we go. Okay, fever often unreliable in the uh, in the patients with UTI. Only about 17% of patients will have urinary infections, and the whole foul-smelling thing is not reliable. I mean, it's neither sensitive nor specific, right? When was the last time you found a pleasant smell? No, um, you can't rely on you can't rely on the foul smell. Okay, you can't rely on the dysuria, the frequency, the classic urinary symptoms, abnormal white count. Can't rely on that either. Last refuge of the intellectually destitute. It's working now. Thanks, Chris. Um, and here we go again. Delirium and tachypnea. More than 25% of elder patients with UTIs will present with delirium. More than 25% will present with tachypnea. Just a bladder infection, and they show up with tachypnea. So again, please check that respiratory rate. Asymptomatic bacteria. What do you do with that? right? That's when you see some bacteria, but there's no white cells. Or even sometimes you see asymptomatic pyuria, white cells, but no bacteria. It's very common, and the literature seems to suggest that if you don't have both bacteria and white cells, you don't need to treat it. If you see both, by all means, treat it. And also lower your threshold. You know, sometimes we'll have people say, well, there's only five or ten white cells in the urine. That's not a real infection. You know what? There shouldn't be any white cells in the urine if it's a clean specimen. If you've got no epis on that sample, you know, go ahead and treat that if there's bacteria also. Otherwise, those patients are at high risk for developing bad urinary infections. All right? Fortunately, the bugs that we normally think of are most common. E. coli, so your antibiotics, use your, your usual antibiotics, your third-generation cephalosporins are great, and probably your first-line agent. Amoxicillin clavulanate or augmentin, that's a big gun. I would say just go with your cephalosporins, and those are a perfect first-line medication. There's increasing resistance to the quinolones, as most of you have probably seen, and also macrodantin or macrobid is not generally recommended because of its side effect profile, and it also doesn't cover ascending infections well. Just go with your cephalosporins. They're very effective, and they're fairly cheap. All right? Let's talk briefly about pneumonia, right? There's no doubt about this one, but even lobar pneumonias, single lobar pneumonia in elderly patients, you've got to worry about because they are immunocompromised. Pneumonia is different in the elderly. It's the sixth leading cause of death in the elderly, and there's a lot of reasons why they're at increased risk. They don't have the same mucociliary response and protection. They have a diminished cough. If you or I get a pneumonia, we're going to cough. It's a protective reflex. Elderly patients don't have the same cough reflex, so they don't have that same protective feature. They have decrease in alveolar uh, macrophage function and neutrophils, another reason that they're immunocompromised. Poor dental care is also a big risk factor for certain types of pneumonias as well. And in the older population, poor dental care becomes very, very common. All of the typical symptoms tend to be unreliable. Cough. Pretty good, but not nearly perfect. Shortness of breath, pretty good, but not nearly perfect. Fever, fever at arrival, pleuritic chest pain. You know, we all learned that strep pneumonia gives you this pleuritic chest pain and the rusty colored sputum, and all of that teaching is based on young, otherwise healthy adults. It doesn't always apply in the older population. In fact, a lot of the studies, just as a general rule, a lot of what we were taught is based on literature on young, healthy patients. Older patients typically got thrown out of the studies. And so that's why geriatric emergency medicine is such a different population. You know, the peds people say kids are not just little adults, they're a different animal. And I think elderly patients also deserve their own curriculum because they have a different set of pathologies as well. Sputum, finally, is not always reliable as well, especially since they don't have a good cough reflex. But here we go again. Key point number four, we talked about delirium and tachypnea are common early markers 
in the elder patient. Count the respiratory rate. Stand at the bedside and count the respiratory rate. All right? When you see 18 or 20 on the chart, it means nobody checked. Stand there and count. You'll be surprised how often the patient who comes in with the triage note of 18, it turns out they're actually breathing at 26, 28, 30. It's the first vital sign that goes bad when people have infections in any part of the body, especially, of course, in the lungs. Organisms, typical organisms, no surprises here. Your treatment, go with broad spectrum. Think about healthcare associated. If they're in a nursing home or if they were recently hospitalized within the past couple of months, treat them for healthcare associated pneumonia. All right? And there is data saying that the earlier you treat them, the better. Getting antibiotics on board within four hours is associated with a significant reduction in hospital mortality, 30-day mortality, and also hospital length of stay. So get those antibiotics as quickly as possible. This is definitely not the patient that you want to just send upstairs and let the admitting folks start the antibiotics. Start the antibiotics as soon as you get that x-ray back and you make that diagnosis when you find the tachypnea. All right, a little mental break here once again. I think uh, Oregon is off in that direction, apparently. Um, all right, and uh, we're getting close to, uh, close to... I love this next sign. This next one is from a restaurant in South Carolina. Uh, it says, there's plenty of room for all God's creatures right next to the mashed potatoes. <laughs> love that. All right. Saskatoon, that's a hit against Canada there, Amo. All right, before we get our next oh, speaker up... Yet. Dude, oh, I'm not done. Well, I was going to take, oh, take over right now. You're not done? <laughs> okay, keep going. All right, sepsis, jump the gun. <laughs> Don't cut me short. All right, we're going to talk about sepsis. Sepsis is not that important to DQ, but we're going to keep talking about it. So, um, so what's different about sepsis in the elderly patient? More than 60% of patients in the U.S. are diagnosed with sepsis. Uh, are in the older population, elderly have a higher mortality. Now, the good news I have for you, I mentioned a moment ago, a lot of what we were taught is based on studies in young, health, otherwise healthy patients. And so we can't always extrapolate that to the elderly. However, the good news is, with regards to sepsis, more than uh, probably about two-thirds of the patients that were in the early sepsis studies, including early goal-directed therapy by Manny Rivers, about two-thirds of those patients were elderly. So all of what we've learned about managing sepsis in the past 10 years is completely relevant and useful for elderly patients also, all right? But bear in mind the presentation is different. How do they present? Tachypnea and delirium once again. Count that respiratory rate, and when you've got a patient that's got altered mental status, delirium, think about infections, think about medications at the top of your differential. There's a million things that produce delirium, but you've got to think about infections at the top of that differential. If you miss it, there's a tremendous mortality rate. All right, most common source, respiratory, think GU, think about the abdomen as well. We talked about that. And treatment should take into account broad spectrum, number of bugs, gram negatives, um, nursing home and healthcare associated organisms and multi-drug resistant organisms are very common as well. Treatment should begin as quickly as possible. As soon as you make that diagnosis, you get the broad spectrum antibiotics on board quickly. And one of the very important points that I think Haney brought up yesterday is that when you write for the antibiotics, make sure the nurses give the broad spectrum antibiotic first. And the example he used yesterday was, if let's say you write for a university typically We'll give Zosin, which is uh, piperacillin, um, and, uh, Zosin, whatever, and, and vancomycin, okay? And because vancomycin goes in more quickly, the nurses oftentimes will hand the vanco hang the vancomycin first. But if you're going to hang one of the drugs first, go with the broad-spectrum drug first, and then the more narrow vancomycin afterwards, all right? Go with the broad-spectrum drug to be hung first. Get that in as quickly as possible. All right. Again, at the bottom, I mentioned this already, the average age of patients in the early goal-directed therapy study was 67. So everything that Manny Rivers and everyone else has taught us about sepsis is completely relevant to the elder population. That's the good news there. All right. Be vigilant, be aggressive, and as I said before, be aggressive with IV fluids. Don't withhold fluids just because you're worried somebody's going to develop CHF. You know what? We can treat CHF. If you put somebody in a CHF, you know how to treat that. You tube them if necessary, okay? And I don't mean to sound cavalier about that, 
Because the intensive care folks say the same thing. They'll come down and say, you've got to be aggressive about fluids. If you put them, th- this is what the intensive care folks tell us. They say, if you put them into CHF, you know how to take care of that. But if you under-resuscitate someone, you're killing them. You're letting them die. So be aggressive with IV fluids. And again, I'll make this important point. The average septic patient comes in about six to eight liters depleted. So when you start that IV fluid at, you know, 150, 200, 250 cc's an hour, you're just letting them die. Run the fluids in fast, bolus them with the first couple of liters, and that's the way, and then get your monitored lactate levels. That's how you're going to make them better quickly and monitor those lactates. Don't let them be under resuscitated. All right, so take home points. Don't rely on fever. And again, redefine the cut points for fever. 99 Fahrenheit, 37.2 in the elderly population. And you'll increase your sensitivity, still maintaining a pretty good specificity. What else? Delirium is a very common presentation in elder folks that come in with infections. And the first vital sign abnormality in infections in the head, in the lungs, the thorax, the belly, in the bladder, the first vital sign that starts going bad is tachypnea. So stand at the bedside and count the respiratory rate. It's the earliest marker of an infection. And don't rely on the white count. Next time you rely on a white count, just remember you're being intellectually destitute. Don't rely on the white count to rule in or rule out infection. It's a horrendous lab test. It's very sens- non-sensitive and non-specific. All right? Be aggressive with resuscitation. Follow lactate levels or base deficits. Follow all the usual guidelines for early goal-directed therapy. And if you don't find a source, please remember to look in the belly. All right? So again, every elderly patient is going to die on you unless you're paranoid. You've got to be paranoid. Look for the source of infection. And with that, Diku, I will hand it over to you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>